Good evening all and welcome. Tonight we're going to be heading into the realm of the paranormal for a bunch of spooky stories. Also, tonight's artist in the spotlight is at Socially Transmitted Disorder. I really enjoy the art style and the creepy imagery of a spectral figure leaning over a crib, especially as a soon-to-be father of two. But for now it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. When I was a little kid, we lived on the outskirts of Jackson, Ohio, out in the middle of the woods. My older brothers would sometimes have to take me out with them when they explored so that my mum could get some free time. We were going pretty far back one day, following along a dry creek bed, when we came across a deep hole in the middle of the creek like a sinkhole. My brothers were joking around about having me go in it, when we heard a big tree fall about a thousand feet off, and then shortly after that, another. We freaked out and ran, assuming Bigfoot was chasing after us or an axe murderer. Now, the memory being in that woods that sticks with me the most isn't necessarily the creepiest, but kind of the most, what was that, moment of my life. My friends and I were playing in the woods like usual, climbing a steep hillside that led up to a path we often used. At the bottom of the hillside was a rocky creek bed. The climb was anywhere between 70 to 90 degrees with roots and clay at the height of 150 feet or so. We were climbing, as we usually do. I'm nearly at the top, when I lose my balance and start to fall back, at which point I feel a firm hand on my back that helps me regain my balance. Once I make it to the top, I thank whoever it was that helped me stay steady, but my two friends both looked at me as if I were crazy and said neither of them had done anything. That was by far one of the strangest experiences of my life and I remember it clearly, some 20 plus years later. There was a guy who I used to work with called Dan. Dan was a chill guy who everyone got on with, but was a little weird at times. He used to believe in a lot of things, aliens, ghosts, government experiments, the lot. He wasn't religious, but that's besides the point. While messing around at work, he explained stupid things to us about how he's seen spaceships and how all this paranormal stuff happens when he's at home. Some of it is quite ridiculous, but I listen anyway. A few weeks later, he invites me for a round of beers. I was driving, so I couldn't really drink, but I still went over. We get on the subject of ghosts and he starts explaining things to me, like how he was once eating an apple and it just exploded as he went to take a bite. I laughed it off, and thought it could have just been some sort of pressure with the way he was holding it, causing it to explode. But he was deadly serious, and pulled out a few pictures of this apple, and started showing me the damage it had done to him. There was a picture of him with a cut on his cheek caused by the apple. However, I was still unconvinced this meant there was a ghost in his house. He wasn't messing around, and told me to hold on, and that he'd show me something. And he pulls out of this shoebox, full of pictures from around the house, and just says, flick through those, you'll see. With a deep sigh, I say, okay. I go through these pictures of a recent Christmas, the usual photos, kids opening presents, the family having Christmas dinner, having a few drinks at night, a group shot. That's when I stop. This was the photo that left me in awe. His family was standing in front of this mirror, and I kid you not, in the reflection of the mirror was an Edwardian girl smiling straight at the camera. This was not one of those could be a smudge type of thing. It was not hidden behind someone can barely make it out either, no. This was a clear, coloured, 
take and photograph, with the girl's reflection being black and white. You could make out her face, her smile, her clothes, her hands, everything. It doesn't end there, though. Dan says to me, told you I wasn't kidding you. I go to the next photo, same sort of thing. Family members have moved around and so had the girl. She's doing a different pose. She's smiling now and showing her teeth. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There was this black and white girl standing right in the mirror smiling at me like she'd been there the whole time. I felt like someone had just thrown a bucket of ice cold water over me, like I was being watched, like I wasn't welcome anymore and felt like I needed to leave. I put the photos back in the box and left shortly after. I still don't believe in ghosts or aliens or anything like that, but I know what I saw and I know that it scared the hell out of me. Some years back, I was at university with a friend I'd known from school. We weren't best friends, but good mates. We'd known about each other and got on well enough. I knew that he was a spiritualist, and he'd sometimes talk about his spiritual guide and whatnot. Not really what I believe in, but each to their own. Anyway, we were both hanging around the halls of residence where I lived, as he lived in another hall wasting time and watching crap on the tiny TV in the shared kitchen. We were waiting until 2am, as that's when WWE or WWF as it was called then would be showing. As we didn't have Sky or cable for our American friends, we would often wait up in the halls, then walk down to the local 24 hour snooker slash pool hall, which would show Sky Sports. Usually you could ask them to stick the wrestling on and turn the volume up. We're chatting a lot of rubbish and just watching stupid stuff on the TV. Can't remember what we were talking about, but I remember after that, it wasn't anything creepy. We hadn't been drinking or anything either, and we're all completely sober. We're chatting away, when we realize we need to get down to the pool hall if we want to catch the wrestling. So we stick on our coats and continue our conversation. As we're walking outside, now it's the weirdest thing. The moment I walk through the door, I feel cold. Bear in mind, it's 2 a.m. This is England, sometime in the spring, so it wasn't gonna be warm out, but I mean, it's like I had chills running up and down my spine. Cliche, perhaps, but the best way I can describe it, it is the slow feeling of creeping dread you get when you're watching some scary movie and the ominous music starts to play. I tried to shrug it off, but it's like the dread was increasing with each step down the street. The air actually felt heavy, like it was difficult to breathe. I know it sounds like any other creepy pasta story, but it's the only way I know how to describe that horrible feeling in my gut. A minute out the door, I suddenly realized we were both silent. We were chatting and laughing as we left the halls, but our conversation seemed to have just faded out of existence. I remember looking down the street, thinking that perhaps this was me being nervous about any dodgy characters nearby, but the road was clear. It was a clear night, nothing out of the ordinary at all. But to me, there was this massive alarm going off in my head. I was terrified of something, and I didn't know what. Picking up on the silence finally, I simply said, Hmm, air feels a little thick tonight. My throat was dry at this point. He looked at me with a pale face and said, Oh God, you can feel it too. We managed to hold a halting conversation about what it could be, but it was difficult as we both felt sick to our stomachs. Finally, as we crossed the road, I remember my friend turning even more white and saying, it's death. Death is here. I don't really remember much after we crossed the road. Weirdly, the strange feeling suddenly subsided and we both laughed it off, even though we'd both felt it. We made it to the pool hall, and I didn't think much of it for a few days. It wasn't until later in the week that I was walking from uni without my friend, 
that I passed a building close to the halls on the road we'd crossed over where my friend had felt death. There were three police cars and an ambulance there. I remember watching in horror as a pair of coroners were removing a body wrapped up in black. We looked it up in the local paper the next day. Apparently, three homeless people had died together in the building after seeking shelter, and they'd been dead for a few days before being discovered and removed. Never did find out what they died of, and we didn't go see much wrestling after that. When I was in college, it was the height of all the ghost hunting shows. I was always really interested in the possibility of it all since I was a kid. I didn't know if I believed in it or not. I just liked the idea of investigating it all. So I began doing research. I read books, watched documentaries, and studied different techniques. The more and more I learned, the more I realized that going into a situation looking for ghosts or spirits will completely ruin an investigation. What tends to happen with this mentality is that your brain starts finding things that aren't there. So I started to train myself to go into situations as a skeptic, and instead of looking for the paranormal, it was better to look for normal explanations for the abnormal. While doing this, I've met people from all walks of life who also adopted this method. We eventually made a club in our university that actually became the most active and sought after club to be a part of. We were invited to houses, businesses and historic parts, Gettysburg namely, to see what explanations and evidence we could find. We would handpick teams for special investigations if we considered them serious. We did this because the club was open enrollment and while we could take days to have fresher courses or do and don'ts during investigations, they would still be people looking to find ghosts. Out of all the investigations we did, we had three places we went to that we could not explain what we had captured on video and sound. One was a theater in our home city. The entire night we caught nothing and thought it was a bust even going through evidence, which we would do three times, provided almost nothing. Until a co-investigator's mother walked through the room where we were watching a tape of the entire theatre and said, Who the hell's up there? We made her show us. In the balcony seats, which were locked that night, and we were not allowed up there because of the antiques in it, there was a lamp lit behind a window curtain. You could see a figure move in front of the light of the lamp to almost block it completely. Similarly, as if you were to put a white sheet in front of a light to deaden the intensity of it. And then you could see something pull back the curtain a little bit, as if it were peeking out. The whole thing lasted about 15 seconds. We checked our records of where each group was at the time and asked each person if they had been in the balcony. All responded no. We then asked our guide who would unlock and lock the sections where we were investigating, to which she responds that she did not have a key to the balcony because of what was inside them. Regardless, she was with my group at the time of the event and every other person at the investigation was accounted for, because we were able to match up timestamps from their recordings. The second is Gettysburg. There were three instances at Gettysburg that were unexplainable. This evidence has been lost because we did this investigation close to seven years ago, when we were less organized. The first was a picture, one of the best I've seen. There were actually three pictures that ran together. The first two, being just fog that seemed to have a blue hue to it, and the last one sending chills down my spine, because it was a clear as day man, lying on a rock at Devil's Den, looking at little round top from the bottom, dressed in full confederate garb, when first looking at it, 
it looked like the picture was distorted until you realize you can make out the whiskers in his beard and the gold in his patches on his hat and arms of his coat. The second, which I was not there for, was supposedly a piece of paper that was put on a rock in the woods that said, what's your name? They walked back about 40 feet or so and recorded and watched for half hour to make sure it wasn't tampered with. When they went back, there were clearly scribbles on the paper, but it wasn't anything legible. The third and final Gettysburg story is when I was walking through an area between the wheat field and Cemetery Ridge. I was with two or three others, and we had about 10 feet between us as we walked in line. This is all on digital record. You can hear something hit me in the back, like if someone threw a rock or something, and I stopped and said, ouch, Joe, what the hell, dude? To which he says, he didn't do anything. At the time this happened, we were all stopped, and throughout the recording you can hear us all go silent, and in the distance hear a drum play a few beats. We didn't hear this at the time. We were stopped until we listened to the recording later, but Joe was mentioned previously as a drummer, and went white when he heard it. He listened a few more times before telling us it was a halt from a drumline. The third one is very lengthy and I feel like I want to save it for another day. I do not currently do these investigations and I'll be the first one in the room to be a skeptic with any paranormal claim, but there were a few times that I was stumped. I'm not saying I know if ghosts exist or not. I don't have that answer. I can however say that there are things in this world we do not understand. Throughout the years we did the club in the university, we became highly recognized, having been given awards from the school for what we have done in our investigations, tactics, and also community and charitable work. Doing investigations are absolutely not what you see on TV. They are much more boring, and you seldom have anything happen. But it's a labor of love. It's hard to explain. Because once you find that one piece of footage you can't explain, you want more. I know I'll get backlash from these claims, I always do when I post my experiences, but I promise on my parents' lives that what I say I did, did indeed happen. I have not tried to emphasize any of it, and I have told these stories as they happened. When I was a kid, a bunch of strange crap would happen, but my parents would lie as not to alert me. That didn't stop them from telling me when I was old enough, though. One particular occurrence was that almost every night, there would seem to be someone who went down to our hall and would seem to toggle with the doorknobs as if they were locking them. But everyone in the house at this time was asleep. Another strange happening was that I heard laughing that didn't belong to anyone in the house. I asked my mum if she had one of her friends over from work, and she just replied, yes, but they've left now. I left it at that. In hindsight, there's no possible way anyone could have gotten out of the house in the time it took for me to hear the laugh and approach my mum. Lastly, there was a very strange event that happened to my sister that she swears by. It was outside, sunny, about 10, and she thinks to herself, mum and dad are gonna be late to work. So she goes to wake them up, only to find a disgruntled couple saying it's the middle of the night. She goes to the window again, only to find that the day has ended and it's already night. I've heard this time loss ordeal could potentially be attributed to aliens. My uncle bought a new house a few years ago, and apparently there was an old woman who had trouble letting go. My aunt found said lady just lounging on the couch. She freaks out and demands that she leaves her house because it's theirs now. And as far as I'm aware, she did, and the spectre moved on. We got into a car accident, the car flipped, 
and I got shot out of a window because I didn't wear my seatbelt. One second I'm in the car, the next I'm staring up at the night sky. I try and get up, but it hurts so badly that I just lay down and sleep. It's just a weird dream, I think to myself. Then an unknown amount of time later, I'm suddenly lifted up by sturdy hands and pushed. They push me towards something, so I start walking. I'll never forget how sturdy those hands were, like the definition of sturdy. The next thing I know, I'm at the crash site asking if this is a dream. According to my family, they were convinced I was under the car because they couldn't find me. Then suddenly, wandered up, incoherently babbling all over, asking if it was a dream. I never knew whose hands they were, or if they were even hands, to be honest. It's just such a vivid part of my murky memory. I basically broke through the window with my head. So who knows? I have an identical twin sister and have experienced some strange stuff. Once, when she was flying from New Zealand to California, about an hour into the flight, she experienced the worst turbulence of her life. Food was flying everywhere. Passengers were scared, and the pilot even came on to say that he'd never encountered anything like it in his 20 years of flying. Now, as you can imagine, my sister was pretty freaked out and scared, especially since she had a long way to go before the flight was over. But fortunately, it only lasted about 10 minutes. I was on the East Coast at the time and woke up in the middle of the night out of a dead sleep feeling terribly frightened. I was so anxious that I just sat in my bed and just knew that something was wrong with my sister. I remember looking at the clock and wondering what would wake me. It was about 3 a.m. I felt hopeless and interestingly enough, kind of nauseous. After 10 minutes, the feeling faded. I felt that my sis was fine and resumed sleep. Hours later, once her flight had landed, she called me to let me know that she was back in the States. I asked her how the flight was and asked if she had any turbulence. And she was like, yes, it was terrible. Food was flying, the attendants had to buckle up. Everyone was just waiting to fall out the sky. I asked her what time it happened. And after doing the math with time zones, it was when I woke up to that feeling of being scared and sick. She told me that the plane was hitting bad turbulence. They tried going down in altitude, which made her stomach queasy. Lots of stuff like that happened with us, but that was the first time something woke me up in the middle of the night. Twin connections are strange. I served in the Oregon Eugene mission in the US from October 2015 to October 2017. My first area was on the coast in Bandon, a town where some Native Americans massacred some settlers, not to mention the town burning down. My mission companion, Jake, and I lived in a home that the church rented for us that was right next to the docks. In our study room, we had a sliding glass door that led to the backyard. On that same outside wall, was the window that led to the garage. In the garage below that window was our washer and dryer. If you were in either the study with the sliding door or in the garage alone at night, you would hear someone knock two or three times quite fast. But when you would go to check, no one would be there. Many times one of us would be reading my scriptures and planning some lesson details, while the other was in the bathroom or kitchen. The tapping would happen, and the person who wasn't in the room would come in and ask if it was what we dubbed the glass tapper. When I got my new companion, Mike, about six weeks into my mission, I started hearing some weird things in the abandoned house, other than the glass tapper. 
we would come home to hear someone running around our apartment and oftentimes see our fridge shake for no reason, as if one peg were too short. One day, I had it and looked at the fridge and yelled, Stop it! which actually seemed to work. My original companion Jake in this same house in Bandon and I were laying down in my bed at night. My missionary companion was in his bed on the opposite wall of the room. My back was to him, and we were just talking about what we did before our mission, girls and whatnot. My companion got up to use the bathroom, and once he shut the door I heard someone crawl into his bed as if they pulled the cover over themselves. I knew it wasn't him because I could hear him peeing. I didn't turn over to look and see, because I was shocked. And yes, I told him after he crawled into bed again, because I didn't know how to bring it up. About six months into my mission, I was in Roseburg, Oregon. I started to have dreams. I wouldn't exactly call them nightmares like of demons, like the supernatural ones with black eyes, but they had smiles like the cartoon Grinch that were really long and curly. They would tell me I was no good and going to hell and would put my arm to the square and cast them away, but they never left. They usually just shut up and stared at me. I started to wear my mission tag that's commonly associated with Mormon missionaries to bed and that completely solved the dream problem. But sometimes I would just be laying there and feel the end of my bed shake, not violently, but enough to wake me up and just to let me know they were still there. It still happens sometimes, no nightmares, but the shaking still happens. I don't know how to tell that part to my wife. In Roseburg, Oregon, my companions and I were teaching a family once they eventually told us that their baby girls who were two on one would wake up in the night and point to a particular corner of the room as they screamed. They also had an old railroad lantern that got so hot the glass shattered. They asked us to perform an exorcism on the home. We told them that we would bless the house and they asked me to act as a voice for it as I was praying, I felt as if there was someone standing so close to me that the face was only an inch away. You know the feeling when someone is getting close to your face when your eyes are closed. How can you sense it? It was like that, but hot, like an oven. These are my experiences, and I don't know how to explain them away. When I was six years old, we lived in the center of the set of three very similar houses. I remember ours was purple, the one to the left was blue, and the one to the right was yellow. I recently had bought one of those big inflatable bouncy balls from Walmart and had no one to play with me, so I played with it in the backyard by myself. After school one day, I accidentally hit the purple ball to the yellow house side of the fence. I was going to ask my mum what to do, but a kid on the other side hit it back over to me. Thinking we could play, I hit it back over and he returned it. It became a daily thing and I would just hit the ball back and forth with him until I got bored after school. The kid wouldn't respond to any questions I had, so I assumed he was just shy. At one point, I hit it over and he didn't return it so I asked my mum if I could climb the fence and go get it. She was never outside with me, so she always thought I was playing alone, I guess. We only got the house because my mum was friends with the landlord, and the houses were recently built. She told me that no one had ever lived there, and that they were trying to sell it. We moved not long after, but I still have no idea who was returning that ball to me. I'm 30 years old now, but want to share with you a true story that my dad told me when I was around 10, and has stuck with me till this day. 
I am originally from Romania. I want you to know where I'm from because a lot of you probably haven't have heard of it, or if you do know it from Dracula. One thing you need to know in order to understand the impact that the story had on me was that we are a country where the majority have a strong belief in God and evil, angels and demons. My dad is, well, something similar to a Catholic. He sings in church, he's not a priest. Back home we have a priest and a singer. That's called a Daskal, and they do every church together like the Sunday prairies, the baptisms, the wedding and stuff. Anyway, one summer night they went to do the ceremony for someone who'd passed away. They were all there singing, when all of a sudden it started to get really cold inside the room. They could even see their breath forming in front of them, despite the fact it was the middle of summer. My father and the priest look at each other, and they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to say anything to the family, because they didn't want to scare them. So they continued. A few minutes later, my dad started to lose his voice. He was opening his mouth, trying to sing, but the words didn't come out. And all of a sudden, they heard a big bang just over their heads in the attic, and the ceiling started to get red, and a fluid began dripping. That was something they couldn't ignore. They went to see what happened. And when they hit the attic, they saw a big glass barrel that was full with red wine had exploded out the blue. They went downstairs, finished the ceremony, and then went home. On his way home, my dad had to walk by the cemetery. He had done that for many years. It was a normal thing for him to do, not remotely frightening. But after what had happened that night, he felt something was wrong. It was about 11 and just him on the road after he passed the cemetery. And then suddenly he couldn't shake the feeling like something was following him. He was kind of shocked after what happened, and too scared to turn around. The feeling engulfed him. It was as if it were getting closer, feeling its breath on his neck, and his hair stood on end. All of his senses told him not to turn around, which he did and he just went home in a straight line. When he got home, my mum was waiting for him on the porch. He entered the front garden, and locked the gate behind him, and when he reached my mother, she asked him, Who's the man behind you? She said that there was a tall man behind him. The next morning, when they wake up, they found the front gates open. My dad always said to me that the devil always tries to scare you and get the ones with a strong belief in God. If they don't try and scare you, it's because they don't need to, because you've already turned away from him, according to my dad. I had an apartment in grad school that was set up in a way that you walk into the living room from the main door and there's a door to the dining room and kitchen, and then a hallway to the bedroom and bathroom in the back. Only the person sitting in the chair by that door from the living room to the kitchen could see into the rest of the apartment. So one afternoon I had a friend from work over, and she brought her friend Hannah with her. My friend and I were on the couch and Hannah was in the chair that could see into the rest of the apartment. We had a good visit, with nothing remarkable to note. A few days later, I saw my friend at work. She had a weird look on her face, and she walked up and said, Hannah said the weirdest thing when we left your apartment the other day. She said Sammy's roommate must be horrible. Apparently, she saw a young woman walk out the bedroom and into the kitchen, get a glass from the cupboard, fill it with water, then take a drink, rinse it, dry it, and put it away while glaring at Hannah the entire time. Then she walked back into the bedroom. This is weird, because I lived alone. A few months later, my best friend and I were watching a movie in the living room, and I decided to go to bed a little earlier than her. When I left her, she was laying on the couch with my dog. About five minutes later, I heard my dog growling ferociously for a few minutes. It didn't seem out of the ordinary because my dog had a habit of growling at people that walked on the sidewalk in front of my house. Several more months go by, and I had since moved into a new home. 
The first time my best friend visited me, she said, Thank God you're not in that apartment so I can tell you what I saw. That night she stayed at my house and heard the dog barking. She experienced something. She went on to tell me that she was on the couch with the dog, and then out of nowhere she jumped off the chair and went to the opposite side of the living room and started growling in her direction. All of a sudden, she saw this guy in jeans and a white tee sitting on the floor with his back leaned up against the couch she was on. He was watching the TV and then he turned around to look at her when she jumped, then turned back to watching the TV. She stared for a few seconds and then he vanished from the inside out, like how an old television shuts off. Then the dog jumped back onto the couch with her and the night continued without incident. I never experienced anything weird or had any sort of strange feeling there, but I was pretty sure after that sort of stuff at that point in my life anyway. My friend is a military man, and his family owns a house in a rural area in the Philippines, Nueva Ecija to be exact. I believe it was some sort of family inheritance. The area around the house had been subject to treasure hunters, in search for the infamous and often disputed Yamashita's gold. They decided to put a stop to the digging by going there for themselves to address the issue and also have a vacation at the same time. Their whole family went, from his dad, who was also from the military, to his mom and his two sisters. When they got there, their neighbors advised them to make sure they get inside their house by 5 p.m. without offering any explanation. They found that piece of advice quite odd, but they did so anyway, in case it had something to do with the local wildlife. They stayed in their respective rooms that night, but didn't get much rest because of the strange things that they saw. My friend was getting ready for bed when he noticed that outside the window across the field near the neighbor's property, there was a big dog-like creature. He went to the window to get a better look and he saw this beast that was besides the neighbor's Volkswagen Beetle. What took him aback was that this dog was as big as the car. Then something else caught his eye, a large head sticking out above a line of coconut trees being illuminated by the moonlight, staring right at him, possibly a Capri. He quickly closed the window and decided to stay in bed not knowing if he was seeing things or not. That same night, his sisters had been hanging out in the dining area when they saw a curtain floating around. At first, they thought it was just the wind blowing it around, so they ignored it. But shortly after, realized there was no wind, with all the windows closed, and not a breeze in sight. They freaked out, ran to their rooms, and hid under their sheets for the rest of the night. His parents weren't spared from the freak show at all. In their room, there was an antique closet with nothing in it. At random times during the night, it would swing open, making quite some noise, and after a while would just slam shut on its own. They were sleepy and tired from the day, so they just let it be, thinking it must have been the wind. The next morning, they recounted their experiences and decided that for the next night, they'll all stay in the living room together, figuring that they'll be safer that way. They wanted to stay since it was a long trip going to their rural house and it felt like a waste if they didn't maximize the visit. That night as planned, they slept in the living room. My friend's slumber was interrupted by the sound of heavy breathing and hot air blowing in his face. My friend opened his eyes and his heart skipped a beat after seeing an enormous black mass with red eyes floating above and staring straight back at him. He immediately closed his eyes and tried to grab his gun, but it was just out of reach. He tried to nudge his dad awake, who was also beside him, but to no avail. He finally decided to whisper to him, Pa! There's something on top of us. His father then replied in a very annoyed yet freaked out tone. I know, just shut your eyes and go to sleep. 
They immediately left at the first sign of light. Their week-long vacation reduced to just two days. Also, it just so happened that their house was right next to a cemetery. My friend is a very straightforward guy, so coming from him I tend to believe this story. The only things he wonders about is not being able to attempt a shot at the floating black thing, but he says he didn't want to repeat that again. I just asked him to refresh his memory about the story, and his hairs were at their end. Goosebumps everywhere. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tales. If of course you did, you know what to do. I'd like to give a huge thank you to my amazing members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen. You guys truly are amazing, and I value and appreciate you more than you know. So thank you all. If you too would like to receive some cool extra perks for contributing to the channel and stuff, that'd be great. You can check out the links in the description. Um, has anyone been seeing the Loki series on Disney Plus? Perhaps if you're Marvel fans, you're watching it. I, uh, I just saw the fifth episode. It was really, really good. If you're a fan of Marvel and haven't actually seen it yet, I do strongly recommend it. Also, in other news, my podcast has just relaunched, so if you like podcasts, check it out. And I also featured in Sapphire Sandalo's Stories with Sapphire, her latest podcast episode. So, you know, that there's that too. You can check that out as well. I narrated an exclusive story over there, so if you'd like to listen to it, as well as the podcast, it's really good as well. Feel free to check it out. I'll leave a link in the description for you guys to have a listen after, if you are so inclined. But for now, stay safe, stay awesome, and if you don't have something else to watch, you can click one of the videos on screen, or maybe subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one, hopefully.